Hi folks, this is Matt at Pranakasha Productions. Today we are super fortunate to have Mark Zikri um, that I know as the Space Command guy. Um, but it turns out, like if you look at his Wikipedia page, he has been a science fiction writer and television writer and screenwriter for studio major studios and networks, including Paramount, Universal, Disney, Sony, TriStar, MGM, New Line, CBS, NBC, ABC, Spot not Spock, Fox, WB, <laughs> UPN. Probably you have written something for Spock. All of you? <laughs> yes, written, I have. Have you written, have you actually caused Spock, Leonard Nimoy to speak? Um, not Leonard Nimoy, but I have written for the Spock character. So we can get into that. You okay. Bet. Okay. <laughs> Fox, WB, UPN, Showtime, PBS, Turner, USA Network, Sci-Fi, Discovery, Nickelodeon, BBC. Mm -hmm. That might be yep. interesting. Yeah. Marvel and NPR. And <laughs> yep. he has a Wikipedia page, which is way better than me because I don't have one and I wish I did. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> okay, but this is this may be Mark's crowning achievement, which is this right here. Mm -hmm. Would you say mm -hmm. that's one of your magnum opuses? It's definitely something I'm very proud of. Yeah, absolutely. The Twilight Zone Companion. And uh, but before we get into it, folks, I was in LA just yesterday and the day before, and I was walking around um in the Latino district. I say that because every place I went, I had to speak Spanish. And luckily I know a little bit of Spanish. Great. And then I finally happened upon this place on the sidewalk, no less. Uh. Morales Kebab. Got to know the owner, had some wonderful food and I got to know his wife. And he was so gracious to talk Spanish with me, even though my Spanish kind of sucks, but he was willing to put up with me. I at least had a chance to practice. And um, also, so he's on the sidewalk on Domingo, y, Sabado y Domingo, which means Saturday and Sunday, um, on, hopefully I can read this, East 9th Street and Stanford Avenue, Los Angeles, California. So if you're down in that district, go for it. And then also, the rest of the time, he has um, a restaurant who you can call and order at 213-884-7065 or... 213-985-6671. And that is Morales Kebab. Wonderful food. Okay, Great. off we go. Yeah. So tell me about your shirt. <laughs> well, um, I'm moving to Mars. I mean, that's the, I'm a huge Mars fan. I, uh, you know, Martian Chronicles is one of my favorite books. I, oh, yeah. I follow all the NASA stuff with the rovers and I'm, I'm hoping that Elon Musk lands people there before the Chinese do. I think that's really the race Oh, the come on. He's going to totally beat the Chinese. I hope so. I, I hope mean, to see the problem. The problem with the Chinese is they would just like them to keep everything secret until suddenly they're there. And yeah, but like, you can't cow. keep a giant ship secret. You can't <laughs> well, keep like a cheek a secret. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. So we'll, see, we'll see what happens. We'll know soon. We'll know soon. So, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to interrupt you already. Now, if I derail you too much, just say, Matt, shut up, because I tend to do this. Um, <laughs> That's fine. Since you mentioned Martian Chronicles, what did yeah. you think of the TV show that came out back in the 80s? I wasn't a fan of it. Richard Matheson scripted it and it needed a real poet to do it. It needed someone who could be lyrical. And some of the, some of the casting was very good. Darren McGavin was very good, uh, but it just really didn't capture the great beauty of the book. I, I actually um, uh, worked with Ray Bradbury on doing a, um, oh, a miniseries wow. based a miniseries based on the uh, 22 Martian stories that aren't in the Martian Chronicles, but follow that same chronology. It was called Ray Bradbury's Lost Mars. And uh, it was going to be, I was going to write it and produce it. And I outlined it. And my friend, Michael Nankin, who was a director on Battlestar Galactica, was going to direct it. And uh, it would have been great. I'm, it's still a project I want to do. So we'll see what happens. So you're buddies with Ray Bradbury? I was, yeah. Yeah. He, uh, for over 10 years, I'd go to his house once a month and we'd just sit and talk. And it was it was really wonderful. It was a, a dream of a lifetime. Okay, why isn't that on your Wikipedia page? <laughs> that should be the first line. Well, you know, it's funny because I have a new book coming out. I have a new book coming out called Greenlighting Yourself, which is about how you can kind of make stuff happen in in you know in your career as a writer, director, actor, producer, whatever. And uh, I quote a lot of stuff that Ray told me in those in those times we spent together because he was really, if there was ever a self starter, it was Ray Bradbury. He was he was quite phenomenal. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Amazing guy. Wow. So I guess you also like, uh, did you go out to coffee with Isaac Asimov every week too? Well, a Asimov was, a, was an East coast guy. So I really didn't, didn't, <laughs> ne I never met him, 
Um, a lot of the West Coast writers like George Clayton Johnson and Richard Matheson and Bill Nolan and, you know, so forth, Harlan Ellison, of course. I got to know a lot of those guys really well. So, um, you know, okay. but uh, but there, but science fiction definitely divides into East Coast and West Coast. So what about yeah. Heinlein? I, I, I never met him. He by the time he was speaking at conventions, um, if you had to donate, donate blood uh, to be able to listen to him, give a talk and sign books. And I was always there for work purposes and, and couldn't couldn't donate blood at that point. But I would have loved to have met Heinlein. He was a big um, hero of mine. Wow. OK, wow. Interesting. So, OK, speaking of Heinlein, what about Starship Troopers? Starship, <laughs> it's, a, it's a movie I very much like, but it's a, it's, it's uh, Paul Verhoeven, you know, very much wanted to, to satirize what Heinlein believed in. And so Ginny Heinlein, uh, Robert Heinlein's widow, uh, was no bit no fan of that movie, but I, I really like that movie a lot. And and in Space Command, our hero's father is named Anson after Robert Anson Heinlein. And so there's kind of like that little tip of the hat. And, uh, you know, so I, I name a lot of the characters after classic science fiction writers. So that's a lot of fun. OK, so Space Command, what's this? <laughs> well, um, I know you know, it is, but... you mentioned that I pretty much work for all the major studios and networks. And so recently I had an idea for a, <clears throat> a show that would be sort of a hopeful vision of the future. And uh, and um, <laughs> Throw I, the dog uh, bone. <laughs> yeah, 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 really, exactly. And um, that's not but, one of um, those mechanical dogs that's like out to <laughs> turn you in or anything, right? Yeah, well, it's two of them. It's two of them. So hang, <laughs> hang on just one second. That's All right. <laughs> oh, that was, of course, a reference to oh, Fahrenheit for four. Oh, hang on one second. Hold on one second. You haven't read that book? Shame on you. <laughs> Meanwhile, we'll gaze at the beautiful backdrop of Mark's office. Notice the Starship Enterprise. Just so gently oh. orbiting. Oof. Yikes. Sorry about that. So on no. so forth. They, there we go. Hi, I'm back. Okay. So to answer your question. So with Space Command, I wanted to do a hopeful vision of the future like Star Trek was for me when I was a kid. Okay. And I didn't want to trust the network not to cut me off the script, cut me off the pilot or screw it up with their notes. And so what I did was uh, I reached out to my audience via Kickstarter and, and selling investment shares and they and they stepped up. And as a result, I was able to open my own studio. So far we've shot five hours of Space Command. We're shooting the sixth hour now and uh, just keeps going. So, and you know, meantime, I'm in conversations with Amazon and Netflix and so forth. We'll see if uh, Space Command finds a home with the networks, but so far so good. We're we're shooting now and, uh, and it's great fun. And I've been able to cast whoever I wanted, you know, Doug oh, Jones. Oh, you got some pretty high powered actors in it. Yeah, yeah, well we have, let's see, it's Doug Jones, Mira Furlan, whom we lost to, to um, West Nile virus very sadly, uh, Bob Picardo, um, Billy Mummy, Bruce Boxleitner, James Hong, um, Christina Moses, my friend from uh, uh, A Million Little Things on ABC, Armin Shimmerman is in it, uh, Barbara okay. Bain. Uh, it oh. just goes on and on and on, it's, it's, it's so, super uh, fun. So where, how does Armin Shimmerman appear? I didn't know he was in it. Well, well, during the, during the pandemic, see, I've, I've laid out an entire season of the show, which covers 180 years. And so far we've recorded the prequel as an audio play and as a graphic novel. And then we've shot the first, as I mentioned, you know, uh, we shot the two hour pilot and mm -hmm. beyond that and all, so forth. But I, I had a whole big plan for who would play what roles moving forward through the season. And Armin has a major role. But because it covers a number of generations, we haven't gotten him yet in the chronology. So during the pandemic, I decided to do a, Elaine and I, my wife and I, we wrote, directed and produced a two hour bonus episode of Space Command called Ripple Effect, where, because everyone, all the actors were stuck at home. So we said, well, why don't you shoot your own scenes with your own cameras and we'll edit it all together. Yep. And uh, that's that exactly one. what we did. So we were able to introduce characters who will be later in the season and so Armin had a scene and Christina Moses had a scene and Barbara Bain had a scene and, and so forth. And uh, J.G. Hertzler, who's in, in the show oh, as yeah. well. I yeah. just met I met J.G. Hertzler at, at Star Trek Las Vegas. He's great. He's a great guy. <laughs> he was dressed up like a, a, a pirate the whole time. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, it's great. Sunglasses. So um, for Armin's role, um, mm -hmm. is there any Shakespearean bit to it? It has that quality. And, you know, it's a bigger than life kind of role. But interestingly enough, he plays he plays Bob Picardo's grandson 
interestingly enough, because we're covering 180 years. We're going, we're, we're, sh we're going through five generations of four families over this future history okay. uh, as we go out into space and, and, and so forth. So it's, it's fun. Okay. The reason why I say Shakespeare is because Armin Shimmerman, if you don't know, who plays Quark on DS9, yes. is yes. totally into Shakespeare. In fact, yes. he just wrote a book, right? Huh. Have you read his book yeah. series? Not yet, With, no. It's, it's very excellent. I, oh, dang it, if I, if I had my wits about me, it's sitting in my bedroom right over there. I could bring it out and show you guys. Uh, well, actually, could you like stall for time really fast? <laughs> All right. So I can, I can take over the podcast as he goes off to find the book. Uh, but it's, it's great to be interviewed. I love talking about all this stuff. It's, uh, it's really fun. I have my own YouTube channel, Mr. Sci-Fi. So definitely go check it out. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, I'm at a stage of my career where I can basically do whatever I want to do. And uh, that's uh, <laughs> really terrific. And most of the people who mentored me are, their books are on these shelves right here. Ray Bradbury and, you know, Harlan and all of these great people. So there you go. Right. Did you find was it? There, I hope there wasn't any dead air. No, no dead, no okay. dead air. Ta-da. There it is. Yay. There you go. Wow. Carmen Shimon. And get this, folks. To Matthew Weiss, signed by wow. Arnold Shimmerman. Yeah. That's very cool. That's very cool. It's a great book. Somewhat. It's really well yeah. written. Super interesting. <laughs> He's also got another book coming out soon. So yeah. check it out. And also, Armin's on Twitter. So if you look for him on yes. Twitter, and he'll love to talk to you about this book. <laughs> great. Okay, back great, to great, great. Cool. Go for it. Well, Armin, Armin's a dear friend. And when I, when I saw him on the pilot on uh, DS9, I asked my friend Les Landau, who was a director on the show, to introduce me. And so I first met Armin when he was in the whole Quark regalia. Mm -hmm. And uh, between takes, he would take out the, the, the Ferengi teeth. And they were very, very sharp. And I said, do you ever bite your lip with that with those teeth? And he said, yeah, all the time. <laughs> and uh, But we just struck up a friendship. And we've been friends ever since. And uh, oh, great. you know, ironic, ironically, he uh, worked. He played a role of Pascal on Beauty and the Beast some years earlier. And I wrote for that show. But we didn't oh, cool. know each other at that point. So that's, uh, uh -huh. that's pretty fun. So, but he's, he's a great neat. guy. He's terrific. I love, I love working with him. So are you allowed to give us a little hints about what his character is like in this show besides being the grandson? Yes, yes. Um, Bob Picardo plays a mining foreman on series overseeing a team of <clears throat> synthetic humans that include Doug Jones. And his son, his son becomes sort of a world conqueror. And so the empire that he builds, Armin basically oversees once that character dies and so that nice. so armin basically is almost like an emperor and he has oh, cool. a daughter he has a daughter played by christina moses and uh it's uh it's a fun it's a really fun chronology to follow all this stuff and so yeah. he'll be in one of the upcoming episodes so uh nice yeah it's it's fun and yeah doug, I, doug jones by the way i mean we all know him right now because of um star trek discovery yes, and yes. he's quite a beloved character in there but he's got a he kind of he ended up like quirk he's got like all this makeup on top of him I know. yeah but in in space command we get to see, his, see his face, face and he's so yeah. expressive he's so good in that role i know well the i mean way you, I met, you fall in love yeah. with him he's like wow yeah this is really well, the way, neat the way i met doug was that uh i won the saturn award a few years ago and it's somewhere on the shelf back there and um I saw this tall, thin guy in this wonderful Victorian jacket, and I went to compliment him on the jacket, and it turned out to be Doug, and I, at the time, I was writing a book with Guillermo del Toro, and so we just started talking, and I took him to lunch a few days later, and, and he, as you say, has such a soul and such a yeah. great face. It's such a shame that he's, it's always covered, so I said, I'm going to write a role for you uh, where we see your face. Yeah. And that's exactly what we did with uh, the character of Dor Nevin in, in Space right. Command. And he's got this cool sort of metallic yeah. skull cap yes. thing. So yes. he still looks yes. like an android, but you get all of his face and all the expression. Which yeah, is... well, well, that's, yeah. that's the, the design. Doug, the design of Doug uh, as Dor Nevin is from is by Ian McCaig, who designed Darth Maul and Queen Amidala and a lot of the Star Wars characters. So oh, uh, so he's our character designer on the show. So nice. that's we're in good hands. <laughs> So the thing that amazes me about you is not only about Space Command, but aren't you like juggling like six other shows too right now? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> the uh, well, see, the good part, the good part is because I came up in television. Okay. You know, you 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 multitask. You have to, and okay. uh, many times, like for instance, when we were just talking about Armin, uh, I was a producer on Sliders when they. Oh, shot I love that show. Yeah, yeah, I was, oh, cool. I was a producer on Sliders when they shot Far Beyond the Stars, which was the story I came up with, with for Deep Space Nine. No way, so you they, wrote Far Beyond the Stars? 
I came up with that story, yes. And so I, so two studios were shooting well, my work the second. same week. Can we stop for just a second? I'm sorry. Of course. Sure. Far Beyond the Stars is like people's favorite episode. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm you wrote it? it? You yeah. wrote it? I, I can't, yeah. Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. Holy it crap. was. Yeah. But so, so two studios were shooting my work the same week and uh but i came up with it and i outlined it and i i, I was writing two sliders episodes back to back so uh ira bear and hans beimler did the script for my outline but it was it was it followed it very very um specifically and uh and really? i and okay. i wow. i very much wanted to come i wanted to come up with something that showed the world of science fiction writers of the 50s because i'd been mentored by Harlan and by Theodore sturgeon and all these great writers who wrote for a penny a word or five cents a word and uh they were not becoming millionaires but there wouldn't be star trek or star wars or any of that stuff if not for those guys um, writing for the love of it and so i wanted to show that world and and the issue of why we write science fiction and why it's important and, and so race became ira bear had the idea of of making it very specifically about race and i thought it was a terrific idea and so i we all knew even before it was written i because i had lunch with the entire writing staff when we were batting the story around uh and um we all knew it was going to be one of the great episodes. There was no doubt. It was. And the thing that's so good is like it is so completely relevant now. If you watch yes. it now, amazing. You'd be like, well, so. this just yeah. like speaks to exactly what we're going through now, and this yeah. is thirty years later, or whatever. I know, so like, it's phenomenal. Yeah. So it's like timeless. Yeah. It's literally timeless. Yeah. Well, that's you know. See, I grew up with Star Trek and Twilight Zone and Outer Limits, and I recognize you know from I, I, first of all, I recognize that all the writers who were writing for those shows were also writing all the books I was reading, you know, Ted, Ted Sturgeon and Harlan Ellison and Matheson and Beaumont and Ray Bradbury and, um, and Harlan with City on the Edge of Forever. I mean, oh man, he, another I, completely great episode. Yeah, right there. But, but I realized that one hour of one show can change your life forever. And I take that yeah. responsibility very seriously. And so, so far beyond the stars. So my goal uh, with Far Beyond the Stars and also World Enough in Time, which was a Star Trek thing I did with George, George Decay. Um, that was, goal, by the way, okay. Let's not forget about that because I watched that sure. and that was super good. Thank you. So well, make sure, that's the make whole sure point. to tell us about that too. Well, yeah, but the thing is, I always bring my A game, you know, and because I know that that if I'm lucky, I'll create something that will really last and really move people and really be um, have some profound truth to it. And uh, so I'm very lucky to have done that a number of times. And uh, and also the Twilight Zone Companion, uh, a lot of showrunners read that when they were teenagers and decided to become. Huh. Uh, television writers and uh, and that was that's very um, heartening as well because I know all these guys you know um, Brandon Bragg and Ron Moore and <laughs> my friend Mark Fergus who, who created the, the Expanse and so forth. You know, it's, <laughs> okay, it's cool. so not only are have you, they should put another thing in your Wikipedia that says Master Name Dropper. <laughs> <laughs> well, these are just to me they're just, they're just people. They're just people I know. You know, and uh, it's it's fun because it's fun because the. The heroes I had mentored me, and so I mentor other people, and it kind of becomes this wonderful circular thing of, uh, right. of you know, carrying the torch and passing it on and all that stuff. And uh, but That's yeah, it's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's very very fun. And so yes, you. But to answer your question, yes, I'm creating six new shows. I came up with this idea called the Showrunners Network, <laughs> and the idea is that I'll, that it's a slate of six science fiction and fantasy series uh, created by myself in collaboration with the top showrunners um, making science fiction television over the, last, over the last several decades. And so I'm creating okay. one show with Rock Neil Bannon. I'm creating a show called Sweet Haven, which is um, uh, rock created Farscape and Alienation and Defiance and, um, and Cult and Sequest. And he's currently executive producer on Evil on CBS. And, okay. uh, and that show We've already written this, the pilot script and we've had the first couple table reads. It's got Gates McFadden and Bob Cardo oh, cool. and nice. Veronica Cartwright and Barbara Bain and just on and on. I mean, it's just an amazing cast. And so we're doing that. And then I'm creating another show with Mark Ferguson and Hawk Ostby and they created and run uh, The Expanse. And they I also love The Expanse, by the way. Yeah, yeah. I love and that they show. Wrote, they wrote Children yeah. of Men and Iron Man also and the movies. And um and then the third one is a new Rod Serling project that I'm talking to the Serling family about uh, from from previously unknown Rod Serling material. And it would be narrated by Rod from previously unknown. Unused recordings. clips. 
Yeah. 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 It's really cool. And um, and then the, another show is with my friend Michael Reeves, who writes the Interworld novels with Neil Gaiman, and uh, and so forth. I mean, it just it just keeps going. I mean, it's just partnering with the people I love to work with. And okay. uh, so now, we'll see. Would you mind telling us how old you are? Oh uh, yeah. Well, I, no, it's fine. I'm 66. And, uh, you know, so I've been Most around people for are, are thinking about sipping martinis on the beach and you're like, <laughs> like have well, this had... gigantic empire of six yeah. shows. And <laughs> well, Elaine and Elaine and I, Elaine and I have had the same, Elaine and I have had the same physical trainer for 30 years. So we work out three times a week for three hours at a time. And that's what, and we combine our ages, by the way, Elaine's birthday is August 21st, mine's August 25th. And so we're, we're 142 years old, but, uh, but I told Elaine that, that she could be 42 and I'll be a hundred. And, uh, <laughs> but, but we write and produce and direct together. And, uh, you know, but it's sort of like, you know, I'm, I'm still as passionate and, and as ambitious as I ever was. And now, okay. um, now, because my fans are kind of underwriting me, I can actually do everything I want to do. I, I don't have to ask permission from anybody. So you know, let me ask you this: um, it, There must be a certain amount of stress involved with this. Like, yeah. how do you deal with the stress? Yeah, well, it's good stress. I mean, there's a difference between good stress and bad stress. Bad okay. stress is when you're endlessly frustrated, which is what can happen to people in television, where they come up with a great idea, it's a great show, and the network, for whatever reason, decides not to greenlight it. You know, and um, I don't have that frustration in my life. I have the frustration of having to raise money, but mm -hmm. and having to find ways to sell stuff. But mm -hmm. but that's enormously preferable to uh to the alternative i mean I, I you know every day for me is christmas every day is 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 sheer joy i mean you know huh. what could be more fun i'm approving visual effects uh shots so, i'm 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 working with a whole team i mean it's great so i remember there was a term i don't know if it's still around anymore but there was a yeah. term i think in the 90s where that meant you were self-actualized yes mayor yes no <laughs> i think that's accurate but i have i have my own studio filled with spaceship sets i mean what could be cooler <laughs> than that you know, it's uh, when I was a kid, when I was 10, I was given a trip to the Star Trek set as a Christmas present. And I got to be there for the last episode of Star Trek they ever filmed, turned about oh, cool. in And I got to sit oh, in wow. the captain's chair and stand on the transporter. And being on those sets, it was just so wonderful. And when I go on my own spaceship sets, it's that same joy. And, and when I wrote for Babylon 5 or when I wrote for DS9 or Next Gen uh, uh -huh. Star Trek, um, I, I love going on science fiction sets. They're okay. so wonderful. And okay, speaking um, of sets, did you have you been able to go on the set for the expanse? They got some major sets on that show. That's in that's in Canada. And so Toronto, I'd love to yeah. get the, I'd love to get those sets. I've put out the word to some of my friends that when their shows end, I wouldn't mind having those sets. Oh no, no, no it's never gonna end. <laughs> expanse has twelve seasons in it, I guarantee it. No, it's no, they're ending no, up season six. No, they but are. they're just saying that so that then they can surprise us with season seven. Well, yeah, good luck, <laughs> <laughs> please. But, uh, but, 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 but I've, it's funny because I've actually have, you know, we've, we've built and designed a lot of stuff just from, uh, from, from scratch, but we also have stuff, we have uh, set pieces and spacesuits from, you know, um, uh, Cloverfield Paradox and, and um, Outland and Aliens and oh, uh, wow. on and on. I mean, I just got this really cool throttle and spaceship console from the live action Thunderbirds movie and, mm. uh, you know, so I mean, it's just like really cool stuff. And, uh, you know, because we can, we can, well, see, when I wrote the Twilight Zone Companion, I, I was aware that <clears throat> Rod Serling shot Twilight Zone at MGM and he, act, he had access to every set, every costume, every prop, every everything made by for any MGM movie or TV show or anything. So that's so how he did it. They yeah. used every bit of Forbidden Planet in Twilight Zone. And I love oh, cool. that reuse of things. And so, um, uh, and also when I was a producer on Sliders, I, we were on the Universal lot and I said, uh, do we have access to everything ever made by Universal? You know, all the props, costumes, sets, et cetera. And they said, huh, okay. no one's ever asked us that question, but we'll find out. And they came back and they said, with a very few exceptions, yes. And hmm. so we were using stuff from Jurassic Park and 12 Monkeys and on and wow. on. And uh, so, it, was, so, it was hugely, it was great. And Time Cop, you know. So was, for Sliders, really so you were a producer, were you writing episodes mm -hmm. too? Yes, yes. How I does was, that work? Uh, oh. Well, as a producer, I wrote episodes on my own. I rewrote other people's like scripts. It, sometimes those would be what were called page one rewrites. I wouldn't put my name on those. Uh, I would be coming up with ideas. I'd be coming up with outlines. I'd be rewriting uh, after after they'd shot episodes, like kind of, you know, 
adding things if we needed an extra scene or two. I was okay. taking pitches every day from freelancers. It's the, it's the whole nine yards. And so I'd say out of the 22 episodes, I was responsible for some major piece of at least 19 of them that season. I was on, I was the producer of the fourth season and uh, it was, it was huge fun. I loved it. And uh, you know, but, uh, but I'm, I'm, I've enjoyed a lot of the stuff I've, I've done in my career and I'm still enjoying it. I mean, it's still so much fun to, uh, to come up with all these, all these really fun ideas and work with such brilliant actors. It's, it's neat. Could I ask you about another show that everybody loves? Of course. What's your opinion on Firefly? I think Fox was very stupid to cancel it. What they should have done, it was getting a low rating on the Fox network. They should have slid it over to their cable network, like FX, <clears throat> because that would have allowed them to have a smaller audience and still be financially viable. I think that show could have run and run and run and run. Yeah. I really like the movie Serenity. I think it's great. Mm. And um, I think they were very foolish because science fiction, particularly space going science fiction, has longevity. Yeah. Uh, the fact that they're going to be rebooting Babylon 5 shows that. Yeah. And um, and so I think Fox was very, very short sighted in canceling it. It was a great cast and yeah. uh, and a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Oh, cool. OK, well, now what do we talk about? <laughs> well, we can talk about well, we can talk about World Enough in Time, if you'd like. I mean, OK, that. OK, so. Um, I've always been a huge Star Trek fan and it was really great to be able to, I, I, the story I sold to Star Trek The Next Generation was called First Contact. It wasn't the movie. It was the one where the um, prime directive goes off, a, a planet develops warp drive and the Enterprise is sent to make First Contact. And, uh, you know, so, but, um, but, but my favorite, my favorite character, or one of my favorite characters on the original Star Trek was George Takei, the Sulu. Mm -hmm. And I never thought he had the, the Sulu okay. episodes he okay. deserved. And yeah. in the 70s, in the 70s, they were going to bring Star Trek back. It was called Star Trek Phase Two. They spent a year developing it. They built sets. They did. They did. They cast actors. They cast the entire original cast of Star Trek, except for Nimoy. He was having a legal battle with the studio and with Roddenberry at the point over over merchandise. And so they cast another actor to play a, a Vulcan on that show. And at that time, my friend Michael Reeves went in and pitched um, two storylines, and one was about. Uh, a Sulu and where Sulu gets marooned on an alien planet and and he has a family and, and it's all in the wink of an eye and suddenly he's back on the Enterprise. And it was a great story and they were gonna do it except that Star Wars came out. And when Star Wars came out, they decided to make the Star Trek movie instead of the Star Trek series. And so they pulled the plug. And but I remember that story. And then years later uh, in you know the early 2000s, I was on a Star Trek panel at a convention with people from various iterations of Star Trek, including Walter Koenig. And he mentioned that he was about to go to upstate New York where a group of fans had rebuilt, recreated all of the original Star Trek sets. And he was gonna shoot an episode okay. written by Dorothy Fontana, DC Fontana, who'd written and story edited the original Star Trek. And so I went online that night and looked at what these fans were doing. It was, and it just blew me away. The effects were great. The, yeah, they they really, really knew their stuff. There was affection. There was a real affection. I it, yeah. Right, and so I thought, well, this is something I might be able to utilize. So I contacted the boys in upstate New York and I said, um, would you be interested in, in Michael Reeves and me doing an episode with a, about a Sulu story? And they said, yes. And I said, I'd like to direct it. And uh, also I wanted to upgrade their equipment. They'd been shooting mini DV. I wanted to shoot HD. Uh, and they said, if you can get the cameras. So I spent a, uh, about six months building a team of Hollywood professionals to work mm -hmm. with the fans there. And then we flew to upstate New York and George Takei agreed to be in it. And I cast right. Christina Moses as his daughter. She'd never been right. in she's, anything on And she's fantastic in it. She's phenomenal. Yeah. She'd only done stage. She'd never done TV or film. And now, yeah. of course, she's starring in a million little things on ABC. So she's brilliant. And, yeah. uh, and I cast uh, Grace Lee Whitney to play Yeoman Rand. Uh, or, or actually she's Sulu's first officer on the Excelsior, which they had previously established on, on Star Trek. And, right. um, and, I, and I recorded Major, Major Roddenberry as the computer voice. And so I think that's the last appearance either of them made on, on any iteration yeah. of Star Trek. And uh, the show had 700 visual effect shots and, mm -hmm. and, and yet everyone's in tears at the end because it's a yeah. human story. It's an amazing right. story. And, and rather yeah. than having it take place on the alien planet where Sulu's marooned, because in the interim years, they had done the inner light on Next mm -hmm. Gen. So yeah, I didn't want to do that. One of right. my favorite Next Gen it's, episodes. It's great. Yeah. But I didn't want to just kind of 
uh, reiterate that. And so mm -hmm. I brought them back onto the ship and Sulu now has a grown daughter and he's sort of a barbarian because he's been stuck right. on the same planet for 20 years. And, uh, and it was about the meaning of life. It's about why we live and what, what makes life meaningful. And I just put everything I had into it. It was a solid year of editing. I had, I had, I, before I shot it, I had a contract with, with the guys of state New York, uh, stating that I had final cut. Great. They could, couldn't touch a frame of it. So when you and edited so, because it, because I wasn't going to put in a year and a half of my life. Right. Mm -hmm. And when you I hired edited an editor, it, I hired an editor full time. Now you didn't go all old school and, and you were snipping film and no, stuff like that, no, right? No, it was it was, <laughs> it was on, computer, no, no, right? it was on a computer. Thank okay. God. But, but it was that's that's as a a piece of 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 television as you could imagine. I mean, that's me putting everything I've got into every single okay. shot, every single frame. And uh, I'm enormously proud of it. And then I, and it was wow. funny because we were shooting up in upstate, when we were shooting in upstate New York, because the enterprise sets were in upstate New York. And then we built the Excelsior sets here down in LA. And because it starts and ends on the Excelsior years later and um, huh. on Sulu's ship. But right. uh, when we were up in, in upstate New York it was a very difficult shoot and long hours. And I said to George Takei, I said, a year from now, you and I will be at the World Science Fiction Convention in Japan, and we'll be screening this episode, and then we will answer questions. I'll be speaking in English, you'll be speaking in Japanese, because he's fluent in Japanese. And I said, a year after that, we'll be nominated for Hugo, uh, which is the top award in science fiction. That was absolutely true. That all came to pass. We were also nominated for the Nebula, and, uh, and that was the first time a non-studio, non-network product was ever nominated for either of those awards. And... Uh, so it was, and, but that was basically my first run at, because I, I saw, what I saw with what the fans were doing is mm -hmm. that thanks to digital filmmaking, thanks to the internet, you didn't need a studio or a network to do network quality product mm -hmm. and reach a, a worldwide audience. Right, the, if the, you have the vision. Now, yes. Yeah. Because, and, and also because you can do it edit. way, it doesn't mm -hmm. take nearly as much equipment anymore no, to do no, something doesn't. that visually looks good if, right. if you got somebody that and knows it, what they're doing. And it doesn't, it yeah. doesn't cost millions of dollars either. Yeah. And right. it costs hundreds of thousands. But, well, you, but actually, you, I, you can do it on, you can do it on way less too now. Yes. If you yes, steal stuff from other people's shows. And I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm well, well, yeah. <laughs> that's but, what I do on mine. <laughs> yeah. But, but the, uh, I'll, I'll, but, before we get off of Star Trek, I sure. wanted to throw this one in there. So what is your opinion sure. on the Prime Directive? I think <clears throat> the Prime Directive was a very interesting idea back in Roddenberry's time. I think it's very funny because they're always talking about you, ha you can't interfere with these alien cultures. And every other week, you know, Kirk is like, Breaking you know, the rule. blowing up their computer that they see as a god and 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 quoting the declaration of independence or the constitution <laughs> i mean you know i mean it, it, it's so it so parallels america because Ooh. on the one hand there's the there's the the america the real american dream which is okay. real immigrants come here they can they they there's they're not limited by their class by anything they can rise it is a dream the dem democracy is real but then there's that that 1960s uh, Vietnam era America, where it's like, yeah, we'll just, you know, overthrow governments we don't like, you know, we'll just blow and that. But, but we cool. still do that now. Yeah. But there's that cool Star Trek episode. But there's yeah. that cool Star Trek episode where the Klingons and the and the Federation go to a planet and the, right. the aliens basically the say, Organians. Well, the Organians yeah, the say, so you can't do that anymore. Yeah, they just they, they mm. basically fuck, fuck both of you. And it's yeah. like, it's great. So, and, okay. Uh, so, yeah. I heard a I heard a theory that the prime directive actually was a metaphor for Vietnam War and it was all about, you know, we shouldn't be messing with all these other countries. We should have, you yeah. know, take a yeah. higher road than that. Do you yes. think that's true? I, I don't know. I haven't heard that, but it's it, but Roddenberry definitely was against the Vietnam War, as were most people of conscience. And uh, and I mean, Star Trek is definitely anti Vietnam War. It's definitely pro uh, civil rights. I mean, you know, it's you can go down the line. It, it's uh, it's a hopeful vision of the future, just like Space Command is. I mean, you. I think, I don't think it's enough to just complain about what's going wrong. You have to, you have to point a way toward positive action that can make things better. Okay. You know, otherwise, because that, and because what, what inspired me to do Space Command was the fact that at the time, a few years ago, all the science fiction was so dark and so nihilistic. Mm, and it was yeah. like, the, and the, be the basic message was the future is going to be shitty and there's nothing you can do about it. So and let's that, all get depressed together. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't, I don't think that's, I don't think that serves a purpose. Right. I don't think that serves a purpose, you know, because having lived as long as I have, okay. the future is always a mixture of 
bad things and good things. Yeah. You know, so so here we are in the 21st century. We don't, we don't have our flying cars, unfortunately, yet. Well, but they'd be we super have, noisy for one thing. Yeah, but, you know, but I always <laughs> call my cell phone a tricorder because it basically is. Yeah. You know, we've got, I mean, it, we live in an amazing time, but that doesn't mean there aren't amazing challenges as well. Okay. But but that's not a bad thing. We just have to convince people to, that we that we can do amazing things when, okay. we, when we come together. Very important point because I've, yeah. you're quite, actually, you're quite um, politically active. Mm, yes. Yes. Not, not here because we don't want to alienate half our crowd. <laughs> if we, yes. <laughs> we'd rather have both sides okay but sure. so so for you like basically i think you already told us we might as well just hammer it home sure. Sure. is that your whole purpose for writing science fiction is really as a metaphor for what's going on in humanity but, right in yeah but it's not but it's not political it's very interesting when i started mr sci-fi because of trump and all the things that were happening i started to talk a little bit about politics uh, because it was so alarming. And some of this Mr. Sci-Fi fans said, please don't talk about politics on Mr. Sci-Fi. So I created a separate channel called Mr. Politics, where I actually do, you know, really go into my opinions. But, I watched it but so, I, a couple but, times. But, but see, here's the thing. Here's the thing that's so important about science fiction. And, and this is true of the original Star Trek and how it inspired me and how it inspired millions of people. It's like, it's not a political message. If you say, we want to have a future where we, when we want, if we want to have, we want to have a future where our children can live in safety, where they can get medical care, where they can get education, where they don't have to fear walking out on the street. That's, that's a message I think that conservatives and liberals across the board, unless you're a sociopath, unless you're some kind of, you know, really racist nutcase, you know, you can agree. People want to be kind in my experience has been that people want to be kind. People right. want to be, um, they, they want to reach across boundaries and barriers. You know, they, huh. They, they don't want to live in fear. And okay. I think that's not a political statement. I think that's a human statement. And that's why science uh -huh. fiction is so great because you can have these, you can show a way toward a good future without polarizing people because you're not talking specifically about the issues of the day. And that's what Rod Serling right. discovered too with Twilight okay. Zone. That's why Twilight Zone is so relevant. You know, yeah. so yeah, absolutely. Most so I don't, consider my, I don't consider myself a political writer. I consider myself um, someone shining a light but, you know, showing a possible future, but I'm not, but I, see, I grew up with the same notion of um, the positive qualities of space exploration, the positive qualities of science and, yeah. and, you know, and so forth. And, you know, cause I grew up during, during the space race and with the moon landing and all that stuff. And uh, interestingly enough, when, when the moon landing happened, there used to be a big old supermarket uh, on the corner of Pico and Robertson here in LA and it was called the Toluca Market. And for some reason, when they were landing on the moon, I wasn't at home, I was at this market. And they piped the moon landing in over the PA system. And most of the other people I was with in that, in the other customers were older women. It was a Jewish area. And it was, they were survivors of the Holocaust. And to be standing there, listening to one of the greatest events mankind had ever pulled off okay. with people who'd survived one of the worst things that humanity had ever done was incredibly meaningful and poignant for me they wow. have the tattoos on their arms you know and i'm oh, jewish wow. as well i'm jewish as well so you know it's uh that was really meaningful so so with ray bradbury and arthur c clark and all of those guys who were writing science fiction when i was growing up they were looking out to the stars and seeing seeing the possibilities for peace the possibilities for hope and i i very much believe in that okay so we have this thing called the um overview effect i'm sure you're aware yes. of that yeah, i know of tell me so that's the opposite. Instead of looking to the stars, we're just up a little bit and we're looking down back at our little spaceship bubble. Yes. Yes. So what yeah. do you have to say about that? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's like we, we live in a terrarium. I mean, you know, there's, <laughs> you know, so we, we should be a lot more careful with it than we are. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, this is the one planet we've got. Mars is not Mars. I, I want I want people to colonize Mars, but it's never going to be a second Earth right. or, or it may be maybe thousands and thousands of years from now and but i wouldn't count on it it's not going to be like a spare tire but <laughs> um, you know it's uh but so i think i think you know hopefully we'll i mean i think climate if there's one good thing to be said about climate change it's like if anything's going to galvanize people to do to to clean up their act a bit it's that because as you get hurricanes and fires and all these things decimating the world right. people are, are starting to to smell the smell the smoke and and realize what's going on their house is right. burning down yeah you know? it's amazing well I've, i just flew to la for the weekend and flew back and just it's mm -hmm. every time you fly in a plane it always blows me away like 
all you got to do is go up. I mean, I swear, after you're 500 feet off the ground, yes, your perspective of humanity from just 500 feet yes. is so drastically changed. Yes. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. This, this, we're In some sense, we're like two-dimensional beings. Yes. You know, and we go up 500 yeah. feet and suddenly everything's different. When you're up 10,000 feet, you look down and you're like, yeah, I feel yeah. a lot different up here. <laughs> yes. Everything yes. Has, and, a, has a lot different meaning, mm -hmm. even at 20,000 feet, which is nothing compared to the size of the earth. Yes. Yeah. And I, yeah, I think it's, 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 I think it's wonderful that in all of these years since the space race started, we haven't killed each other. We have in, in yeah. space. I mean, there's been no war in space yet. And I, and I, I think partially it's because it's such an incredibly dangerous environment okay. that people recognize they have to help each other. They have to save each other. You can't, screw around you can't be reckless in space it doesn't have any margin for error and uh so that's you know that's that's meaningful i, I don't know if we'll okay. be able to maintain that but we didn't um, blow ourselves up yet so you know back back in the day when we started having we had skylab and then we started mm. in the international space station and we've got yes russians and and americans shaking hands yeah did they did nasa ever like turn to write science fiction writers and ask you guys opinions or get asked for yes. advice or all that yes. stuff? Yes, 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 yes. I mean, I mean, Asimov and Heinlein and Arthur C. Clarke and Ray Bradbury, they were, during the time, during the space era, I mean, they popularized the whole notion of space travel. I mean, it's not an obvious thing to go to the moon, really. It's an odd idea. And okay. and so they were working hand in glove with with Werner von Braun and all those guys. Yeah. I mean, you know, after after World War Two. <laughs> okay. You know, but, so that's a very yeah. interesting. Okay, now we got to talk about that. So sure. I don't know if anybody remembers, but I mean, Werner von Braun was like a Nazi scientist, right? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. They, he was. But, so he okay, was in the SS. He was an he was an officer in the SS. Yep. He used slave labor to create the V one and V two and launch them against London. But after the war. There was something called Operation Paperclip, where, where a lot of these Nazi scientists were brought here to work on, um, you know, intercontinental ballistic missiles, nuclear nuclear missiles. But Werner von Braun, his whole thing was he wanted us, you know, us to go into outer space. That was a lot of these guys who were, who were hobbyists in the 30s, um, you know, were, that was their goal. And, uh, you know, so he so, you know, so he was a mixed bag, but Disney, Walt Disney embraced him as this visionary and did these specials on on space travel in the 50s. Um, I've seen some of those. With, yeah. And but again, Ray Bradbury really believed that space was our future. And, and I do, too. Uh, I think, you know, I, we'll see what happens. But so far, it's really cool. I mean, just to see the more we see of the universe, the more astonishing it is, yeah, really. the more cool it is and um and i think i mean even even something like warp drive it's like I, I was talking to a physicist recently and you know they never got a unified field theory where you know because the quantum on the microscopic level the rules are very different from what's on the macroscopic level so very einstein <laughs> einstein kept trying to m merge quantum theory with you know relativity and it and they haven't yet but right. relativity says you can't move faster than the speed of light right. and yet there's the um, linked particles and linked particles. It's, it's not, oh, yeah. they, they have the same, yeah. you know, they're, they're in tandem entangled. Yeah. No matter how, yeah. Entanglement, quantum entanglement, no matter how far apart they are. And that's instantaneous. And so something's going on because that's not governed by the speed of light. I have a theory and, about that. Yes. What is your theory? You have, you have to go kind of spiritual, but it's basically that every particle in the universe is intimately connected with the universe so mm -hmm. and so their connection from that point of view has nothing to do with the speed of light yeah yes but 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 the point being of course that we don't know there's so much we don't know we know much more than we did 100 years ago but there's it's still unfolding and uh you know so we'll see we'll see what happens but i, yeah. I love all of that i love all, yeah. and by the way another another person who's in uh, Space Command and actually has been acting as an advisor is uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, He's yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. so that's, so you just, how do you get these people? You get like the superstars. I asked them. I, I asked <laughs> you just them. call them up. Hey, Neil. Yeah. It's yeah, Mark. You basically. know, can you do my, yeah. could you just like jump into my show every once in a while? Well, it's even <laughs> funnier than that. I'll, t I'll tell you this story. I was, um, uh, one of the people who goes to my gym uh, is Brandon Braga. And I've known Brandon, of course, since the Star Trek The Next Generation days. And, uh, so of course he was doing cosmos and what do you uh, have to do to become a member of this gym 
<laughs> to pay a, reason, a fairly chunky bit of money. But, um, but, it's, uh, but, but the point is, so I was at the gym one day and Brandon had brought in Neil deGrasse Tyson because he was working with Neil on okay. Cosmos and Neil was in town and I guess he, you know, brought him to the gym. So I, walk, I walked up to Neil deGrasse Tyson and I said, uh, if you were going to bring something from outer space to turn around global warming, what would it be? And he said, mm. huh, that's a really interesting question. He said, are you going to be here on Monday? And I said, yes, or Tuesday, I think it was. And this was like on a, fr- on a Saturday. And he said, I'll think about it. So then I went back on Tuesday and he was there and I started running because I run for 35 minutes on a treadmill and he got on the next treadmill and started walking and it took him 30 minutes to explain what he'd come up with. And we put it in the prologue of Space Command. It's in, it's in the prequel. And then he's in the prequel oh, too. And it's, it's Neil really Neil deGrasse Tyson came up with that idea? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's oh, really, I didn't know that. It's really goofy, but that it's was It's a great Neil. idea. No, but it's yeah. cool. And, uh, and so, we, so when we were shooting it, when we, we decided to shoot uh, Ripple Effect, the bonus episode, I, ca- I contacted Neil and I said, uh. would you be open to, to playing yourself in this? And he said, sure. Of course. And so, <laughs> so it, was, it was hugely fun. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, a big part of my life is that I don't stop myself. I, uh, I you know, I, I have a, I have a saying in my wallet that says the bolder I am, the better things go. And, uh, and it's true. It's true. Bolder. The bolder I am, the better things go. Yeah. Uh-huh. There's no you in that, right? Nope. Nope. It's a B-O-L-D-E-R. Nope. Yep. 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 The only boulder is the one you're trying to push up the mountain. You know, so, but uh, yeah, and wow. uh, but it's it's you know it's just I mean when I say I'm living the dream I am I mean it doesn't mean yeah. there aren't struggles and challenges but my God it's right. it's awfully fun I mean imagine working with you know these great these great people I mean it's, right. it's and and uh, and have known and to have known Harlan Ellison and Theodore Sturgeon and yeah. Dorothy Fontana and all these phenomenal I mean the for me the television went from being a one-way conversation where the TV shows were just coming out at me to uh-huh. becoming a two-way conversation. First with me just becoming friends with those writers uh-huh. and then with my creating the television and it became this big conversation. And now it's the conversation between me and the, the audience, the whole yeah, world. The fandom. But it's, again, it's, it's yeah. a two-way conversation just like this, Matt. Right. You know, I mean, you you found me whichever way you found me originally. Yeah. And then I found you on YouTube. I, I stumbled yeah. upon your YouTube channel. YouTube told yeah. me I should watch this. Well, the way and I, then the way somehow I, I, yeah. I can't remember how I found it. Did, twi- did I Twitter you or something? How did I? Yeah, probably. I don't know. Probably. Anyway, but, that's the but, internet. Uh, maybe <laughs> or maybe we were both eating uh, eating kebabs, you know, at, uh, at that well, kebab place. Well, <laughs> maybe if, if I find a time machine, maybe, because that I've yeah. only been in L.A. so many times. And that was the first yeah. time I was at. But, Speaking of kebabs, Morales kebabs again, you know, right there. Morales ke- kebabs. Uh, yeah, go there. Yeah. Go there and enjoy it. But the, the way I came up with this <laughs> sci-fi was. Like the way I came up with Mr. Sci-Fi was I was having lunch a few years ago, a couple of years ago with Glenn Mazzaro, who's a friend of mine who ran uh, Walking Dead. And we were talking science fiction. He said, well, you know so much about science fiction. You should have your own YouTube channel. So I came yep. up with Mr. Sci-Fi because that allowed me to do the major projects like Space Command, which are huge undertakings that take years. Right. And, but, or I could just say, OK, let me talk about the history of science fiction for an hour. And that takes just a, you know a few yeah. minutes of preparation, you know. Really. And now I'm doing now I'm doing the Twilight Zone minutes where every day I talk for a few minutes about a different Twilight right. Zone episode, and I'm going to be doing a hundred commentaries, you know, on and, the Twilight Zone. And the one thing that's so great about we sort of take it for granted, but like back yeah. in the day when TV was, everybody was com- competing for that little slice of time, right? Yes. But yes. nowadays it's changed because like yeah. my my YouTube channel is not competing with other YouTube channels, no. right? No, it's not like no. I need to get into that time slot on Friday night at eight o'clock and beat all right. those other no. guys. No, no. Mine, we all can actually coexist, yes. support each other. We don't have to think yes. of each other as competition anymore. That's, that's right. why you, you, that's why you're on my show. I mean, yes, we can build on each other. You have a great YouTube channel and now your YouTube channel actually has way more subscribers than mine. But yet you're <laughs> here on my show. But, but yeah, but again, but the point yeah. is that it's collaboration, not competition. And yeah. and I think that's a healthier way to live. Uh, and, maybe we should do that on our planet Earth. That's this tiny maybe. little soap bubble in this infinity of nothingness. Yeah, trying my best. <laughs> Rather trying than best. aiming shotguns at each other and you know, <laughs> spo- and fouling the water. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, my whole my whole attitude is is that I can't control what other people do, but I can control what I do more or okay. less. And and so it's like if there's a problem, it's like, yeah, well, what am I doing about that? However. Yeah. 
if you do it well, whatever you do influences a lot of other yeah. people, right? It spreads out. It's true. Right? It's, it's really gratifying in that way. It really is. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun that I'm known for so many different things. So sometimes people will compliment me on Star Trek or, mm-hmm. or the Twilight Zone book or, you know, any number of things. Someone recently com- complimented me on. Yeah, that's right. But some, and someone recently for the first time ever complimented me on the episode I wrote for Forever Night. It's like, oh, great. Or, or, and people compliment me on Wait, Space. Forever Night, what's that? It was, a, it was a show about a detective who's a vampire. It was just a show that was on about 20 years ago. And then also there was a show called Space Precinct that Jerry Anderson did. And I wrote for that thing, too. Huh. And of course, and I started an animation, of course, and wrote for Smurfs and He-Man and Super Friends and Real Ghostbusters and all that stuff when I was in my early 20s, you know. So, <laughs> um, you know, so I've, I've, wow. I've done a lot. You know, well, it's very all funny because right. I once I once was talking to an agent who was considering taking me on. He actually ended up taking me on and he looked at all the credits I'd done and all the people I knew. And he said, my God, you're Zelig. You know, <laughs> and it's like, yeah yes it's true. well yeah it's true. you don't stop and also no. you should mention your wife is like totally on board with all this too right yes yeah. elaine and i've been together elaine and i've been married for 44 years been together for 45 she met me when i was in college and uh and she writes and directs and produces right. with me so sometimes we do our individual projects but we right. get, we also worked very very much hand in glove and, so and like every she's... day we're just you know we're working on space right. command and all of it yeah so it's not like she's yeah, well, tall it's funny because to do it She's not tolerating ahead, what you please. do. She's like a co-collaborator. No. Yes, yes, so like very you much got, so. like the ideal situation going there. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Well, we wrote, we, wow. we, we directed, we recently directed a, a new scene for a uh, space command pilot where there was uh, something that needed to be shot. And there's a sequence where I, I'm in a spacesuit and I get blown up. I get shot by a laser <gasps> blast and blow up. <sighs> and I had one line yelling, telling this, other, this woman with a baby to run. And Elaine was actually directing me to record the, the line. And she's saying, imagine this and visualize this and don't speak until you see it in your mind. It's like, great. You know, I'll, I'll take I'll take direction, you know, so oh, uh, that's so good. It's really well. Fun. Well, Mark, we managed to blow a whole hour. Yay. Right so off the cuff. Funny. So yeah. how about what? And we, um, I suppose you want to maybe do one more uh, spiel about Space Command to wrap it all up. Sure. Sure. We'll definitely Tell check out where Space we can Command. Watch it. You can, mm-hmm. If you go to Mr. Sci-Fi, you can check out Space Command. You can check out. Uh, the Twilight Zone commentaries I'm going to be doing uh, over 100 episodes. Thank you can find it all. Yeah, just go to Mr. Mr. Sci-Fi on YouTube and you're good. So there you wow. go. And uh, you'll see if whatever you're into in terms of science fiction or fantasy or even horror, because mm-hmm. I story edited Friday the 13th, the series as well. Um, you'll find Is anything you'll you find haven't stuff. done. Um, <laughs> Have you written much. for the Hallmark Channel? No, no, I okay, have. There we but, go. I got gotcha. you. Uh, there you go. But there see, you go. But your life isn't complete yet. It isn't complete, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, it's really fun. It's really, really fun. So, so yeah, but so definitely check out Mr. Sci-Fi and you can, that's sort of the portal to everything else I'm doing. Right. Okay, Mark, thank you so much. Um, I mean, again, we could go on for hours and hours and yeah. hours, but we got to like. We'll do it. So, we'll do it another time. We'll, namaskar, we'll, we'll namaste, um, <laughs> and everything. Love you. Thanks, we'll Matt. see you next great. time. All right. Yeah, take, care. take care. Live yeah, long and prosper. <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah. Uncash production. Fantastic creations emerging spontaneously from the space of life. For the benefit of all beings everywhere. We gotta change.